The concept of extended form and how it is exemplified in specific Ellington works is a complicated issue that requires careful observation. There are a few considerations that must be taken into account when determining how or if a piece fits into the extended form category. To begin with, the term appears to imply a piece that involves expansion of pre-existing common musical forms. In a general sense, this may be a valid definition to some extent. On the other hand, one might think of musical organization relative to classical formal models. Western influence composers attempted to sophisticate or refine jazz early in the 20th century by dressing it up for the concert stage, hence the symphonic jazz movement, associated with composers such as George Gershwin and the band leader Paul Whiteman, who commissioned Gershwin to write Rhapsody in Blue as an attempt to provide something that would show that jazz had progressed from the influences of minstrelsy and was a great deal more than savage rhythm from the jungle. Were these reasons why Ellington composed Creole Rhapsody as early as 1931 and the two extended pieces that followed? One thing that is evident from documented interviews with Ellington, he did not suggest that he was influenced by European classical models. As he stated, I guess serious is a confusing word. If serious means European music, I'm not interested in that. I'm not the offspring of a conservatory. I've avoided music schools and conservatories. I did not want to be influenced away from what I felt inside. What also appears to be evident, particularly in Ellington's formal concept of composition in pieces such as Reminiscing in Temple and Diminuendo and Crescendo in Blue, as how a good deal of his efforts or outgrowths or extensions of two common forms which he was familiar with, the blues and song forms. In addition, development appears to be achieved through expansion or linking of basic formal cell units or phrases into larger structures. Another consideration to be taken into account is the fact that in those days, recorded compositions were limited to the three minute 78 RPM recording. Ellington evidently saw the restriction inherent with this limitation and felt the need to record pieces that transcended beyond this. One might further conclude that Ellington wanted to further the potential of jazz as an art form. Though he did not favor having his music labeled merely jazz and led it away from its dedication to improvisation towards something more conceptual in thought in terms of more carefully structured compositions. It is interesting to note how less emphasis is placed on improvisation in the three extended works of the 1930s. Now, there are a number of scholars and music critics who to this day insist upon placing Ellington's extended works in the context of European classical models in an attempt to validate their worth. The author James Lincoln Collier, for example, states, he, Ellington, did not know very much about it, classical music, and never would. Duke never really studied the schemes the 19th century composers used to make a long piece hang together. And his naivete lie in the fact that he did not realize that there were things he did not know. What he needed was a lot of advice from somebody like Will Marion Cook, who had been writing extended forms with unusual lengths and shifts of meter as early as in Dahomey, produced in 1903. But Duke was a proud man who did not like to seek help from anybody, and he went on reinventing the wheel, that is, struggling to solve problems that had already been solved. It is my belief that his growing interest in the extended pieces was one of the great artistic errors in jazz history. They are not very good, and they drew him away from developing the form he was at home with.